Welcome to episode 58 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. In this episode, I sat down with Gordon Lokenberg from the Lokenbergs in Netherlands and asked him how he got started in sourcing. Oh my God. Um, yeah, that's a good question. How did I start? Well, actually it was like I wanted to be an IT consultant. I think that's where it started. <laughs> I had a girlfriend who was a uh, master of economics and she became an IT consultant. And when I would drop the computer, she couldn't repair it and I could. So how come she became an IT consultant and I wasn't? So I got to this manpower office in Amsterdam. It was a, the only manpower IT office back then. Um, asking them like, they have a job for me as an IT consultant. And they said, well, um, why? Why do you want to <laughs> become an IT consultant? I said, well, uh, well, go home, write down why you want to become an IT consultant. So I did, and it was actually quite simple. An IT consultant is always two pages ahead of the manual than the people he's actually talking to. And he's very good at explaining why the cross is up there in the, in the right-hand corner and, and what it does. But how it got there, they don't care. Um, same like me. I don't care how it's been built. I want to know what it is. Um, eventually, with my background in, uh, in the restaurant business and my studies on personnel, I was like, okay, um, why don't you come work here? Talking to IT people as a consultant. Hmm, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so I got there and um, one of the questions during the interview was, um, you're working at a, at a temp, uh, temp office now, so how do you get the people uh, if they're not coming into your office and ask for another job? I said, well, I'll go outside on the street and get them there. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, right. Um, okay, so I got the job, uh, started in January 99 as a, as a recruiter in a temp office. Um, then they got these weird jobs there, like these developers of languages I'd never heard of, and I had to find out how it works. So I got myself trained in, uh, in IT infrastructure, like how does it work, how do, how do components get together and how are things built and what languages are they using. And um, um, now the next question was, get those people in. And sometimes I actually had to go on the streets to find people who could do door-to-door -door sales for IT products. I thought those are the guys who are in the, in the shopping malls, right? On Thursday night at eight o'clock, if they're still walking there, they don't have a job. And they're there with the girlfriend, and the girlfriend wants them to have a job uh, so they can go out and have fun. So actually, it would get them off the street. Um, but having all those, those weird uh, roles, uh, well, there was another cool thing back then. We had one computer with internet connection. <laughs> and that was a free access uh, internet connection. So not supported by headquarters at that point. But we needed it, otherwise we couldn't uh, show our, uh, well, we couldn't see if, uh, if there was a web developer, like what are you building, how does it look like? So it was quite useful that we had that. Um, then these roles came out, um, uh, and, and where would you post them? Like where would you uh, advertise your jobs? Like that's, that's a weird thing, like uh, we could do it in a newspaper, um, but we're looking for developers. and. Back then, you had these these uh, yeah these nerdy websites like uh, Digi, 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 Digital City and stuff like that. And me knowing that was already step one. And then step two was uh, tell your boss like let's put an ad in this community. Why I said well the people we're looking for are probably that nerdy that they would be in this uh, particular area. Good idea. Oh, and we also had Monster, of course. Monster was out, but yeah, it was Monster. Who would use Monster? It was only there for four years and not everybody had a computer. So uh, those were the times that you would go to these uh, easy internet cafes 
where it was uh, the easy yet. Um, uh, they have also had hotels, but they also had these huge, huge halls like filled with computers. And then you could buy for like five euros, you could buy, well, guilders back then. And you could uh, buy internet access for 20 minutes. And then you could actually go on the internet. The good old dial-ups and you had to sit and wait for the dial tone. And... Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. So that was back then. Um, uh, being involved in this internet, uh, um, well, with these internet people, the, the developers and uh, the web developers and the, the, the Java developers and whatever developers, uh, I got to a client uh, which was um, UPC, uh, Liberty Global. And they were working on uh, on a massive project here in the Netherlands. They were buying all the the telco, all, all the the cable companies, and they were building a net, massive network. And I was to us, I was asked to get in there, and to arrange all the manpower uh, attempts in there. Uh, in a year, we had over six hundred attempts in that company wow. via, via us, via manpower, via my desk. Uh, my desk consists out of a computer. I had a computer, I had an answering machine in the beginning, so people could reach me if I was not at my desk, and I had a fax machine, super cool. Um, I had about 500 pages per day on resumes through that fax machine. So every week there was uh, this guy with this, this technician who would fix, and, and fix my fax machine again because it, was all, it went all, all over the place. Um, I would back then walk around with my pile of resumes under my arm, like there, 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 there. And then uh, this department here, you have a pile of resumes, and then every department pile of resumes. And then we do a second round, like, did you have time? Hey, Peter, did you have time to look at the resumes? Uh, no. Okay, let's make time. Do you have two minutes? Let's have a cigarette. <laughs> and then be there half an hour with the guy and then uh, immediately call those people because I managed to get a mobile phone after two months at a mobile phone <laughs> and directly call the uh, the agencies like uh, these guys, these guys uh, have to go uh, an interview tomorrow or day after. That was super cool. But then uh, that stopped because um, they, oh, there was this uh, reorganization thing going on. So I decided to move to another company where we would uh, hire people from Eastern Germany, uh, as far east as possible, close to the Polish border. The Polish border wasn't open yet uh, back then uh, to get those people to work for uh, projects we had in oil and gas, um, in uh, building warehouses, all kinds of jobs, um, and recruit them from the eastern part of Germany and get them on these projects in the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. Uh, getting those people from there was no internet. That was just one small advertisement in a, in a big newspaper, big local newspaper, and then you get 400 applicants. Uh, I had to go over and uh, to say, well, you, 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 and then bring 15, knowing for sure that you could send three back home the next day because they were too drunk, and then uh, move on to the next one. Um, also, we got more access to, uh, to the search databases like Google, and we also have a Dutch resume database uh, from, uh, from government uh, uh, point of view. Uh, so if you're unemployed, your resume should be in there. And I started uh, crawling that database and get people out of there. Then I got into another job after that, uh, after the crisis in 2001, 2003, uh, 2005, where I started working for, um, for uh, what's now called Comscore. Mm -hmm. uh, they measure everything what's happening on, on your website. Uh, back then it was called Netstat. Um, the best thing I could do there was uh, to use the product myself, like measuring what's happening out there, what's happening to my blog posts, what's happening to my squirrels underneath uh, forums or other, my other blog posts, or uh, what would happen if I put an ad on Monster, comparing that to an ad on somewhere else. 
because I could follow the traffic using the system. And that's where I really got into the sourcing part. That's where I, that's also when when Google had its labs and you could try all these these cool things like uh, could we find people on Google Maps? Uh, could we find uh, people on whatever databases they created? Also, the the syntax uh, to write Google strings uh, got better and better. Mm -hmm. Started with the advanced search button, and then ah, this is so. These are the commands. Um, and then uh, at some point, I even bought a cheat sheet from from Shelley, who had Job Machine uh, back then. Yep. And that was a fierce investment. That was that was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, you got so I got creative and like, hey, there's more out there than just just the resume database from 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 Monster or uh, the the other Dutch uh, job sites we had back then. Um, started playing around, uh, being geeky uh, anyway, um, uh, but also things like Second Life, uh, Second Life out there. You know, Second Life. Yeah, been in there. It's, it's like, still there. Just, but. <laughs> it's still there, yeah, but who's using it anymore? Um, there was at that point that uh, Randstad invested like six million into Second Life on building houses and, and offices and, and everything. The best thing for them back then was not that there came revenue from Second Life, but they were not this old gray uh, temp agency anymore. They were hip and happening. They were super modern and... Oh, their, their client base completely changed. So that was good for them. Uh, in the meanwhile, I was walking around on Second Life and, and talking to people like, hey, where are you from? Oh, what are you doing? And I was recruiting uh, global at, uh, at that point. Uh, apart from Antarctica, I've got from all the other <laughs> sections of the world, I got people in. Um, and uh, got into like, hey, what if I post... Um, something in uh, that language on this forum where they're, talk about, where they're talking about this language. Uh, I'm thinking of which one was the first I did. It was um, a really old, yeah, it was Perl, Perl. It was a Perl uh, ad I put on in Perl, on a Perl, uh, Perl site. And what happened, people started responding to that, like, hey, that's fun. It says, if you can read this, you can apply for the job here. Um, then that was all 2006, 2007. I did that. Um, then I got to uh, SourceCon in Miami in uh, ERE. That was ERE, it was. And there was this um, workshop from Shelley and Glenn Goodmacher. And I was in this workshop, like, hey, I know this, I know this, oh, I know this, I know this. Got to meet uh, Glenn Cathy back then and, and all the people from, from the US who were still out there. Um, and we started playing around. And then two weeks later, I saw Glenn coming to the Netherlands for global, global ERE we had back then in uh, Amsterdam City, uh, where we uh, had a lunch. And then after the lunch, we, we uh, grabbed our computers and we started talking about like, hey, do you know this hack? Have you seen this one before? Um, and without me knowing it, next day I was doing this presentation together with Glenn <laughs> on stage, like, okay, <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> um, and being creative with, with the whole sourcing thing, like if you have the commands, there are so many ways you can use the commands and that's like where you start, well, where you actually start doing the sourcing and you think of like, Hey, if, if somebody's doing this, where he's talking about this online, that's actually how I started as well, going into the divisions, like, hey, guys, what do you do online? Um, going back to that story, like, how do I got totally into sourcing, apart from being geeky and stuff, was, like, was um, that my boss at, at uh, Netsat said, uh, Gordon, we need a financial, uh, financial expert or something. Um, I said, okay, that's cool. Um, which, comp which agency do you use for these roles? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Gordon, uh, what does an agency do? 
uh, well, they do. Uh, they post them online, like on Monza usually, in their own website, and then they uh, get resumes in, and then we get three resumes, and uh, those are the ones we've got to talk to and hire one from. How do you know that? Well, I've been doing that myself for the last five years. Okay, so if you could turn around your chair, like it's like completely turn around, and then come back as our internal agency. What do you think of that? <laughs> So, mm, that's a smart idea. <laughs> so I got into, uh, so I had to do it myself. I didn't have any budget uh, for advertisement anymore. Well, I could do it on my own website and I could place some ads somewhere, but I knew already beforehand that it would make that, that much sense. Uh, so I started searching for those people and got into these divisions. I'm like, hey, where are you and what are you doing? And, and that's how I got into that. And then you could def you could immediately see, like I had this, dull marketing role, actually a super cool marketing role because it was one of the first marketing roles where you had to use the, the web analytics, mm -hmm. uh, but you were also, uh, you would also do the, the old school marketing uh, leaflets and, 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 and whatever. Um, and I posted it into my network. Uh, network is a big thing in sourcing as well. You need to know a lot of people. Um, and one of the guys made a post out of it on one of the, 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 the biggest marketing uh, blogs at that point. And um, uh, like a, a web marketeer is hot. It was called a web marketeer back then. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> um, that post got a lot of uh, reactions like, okay, so, and I was asking like, well, is there, what study is there to, to become a web marketeer? Oh, no, you have to audit the didact, and you have to read this book and this book and this book. Well, if, it's, if there's anyone out there uh, knowing all this shit, come and apply. And then, the, and then the simple trick, instead of the URL of your company, like when you do a reaction on a blog post, you have to fill in a website, was not the website like welcome to NetStuff. No, it was directly on the vacancy. And that, that traffic was like, bizarre it was like a hundred people to the, from that post directly into the job and, and got um got a hire from that um but into going into the tricks and doing all the nitty-gritty uh like geeky stuff uh like hey this if usually my trainings are like okay i'm going to show you things in the morning and i know for sure by the end of the day you're capable of doing this yourself and then go back home and show your partner what you're doing, and he will freak out. He will think you're a developer. Even in uh, what's also nice to see, if, you, if you're talking to CTOs and you're, you're showing them what you're doing, and for example, you use a pipe in your search, he's like, a recruiter using a pipe? <laughs> what? <laughs> and that's a funny thing. So that's how I got into this uh, sourcing thing. And in the meanwhile, it's talking to a lot of people like how are doing this. Uh, I had a lot of Skype calls back back in the years. I still have them sometimes. I suggest, oh, okay, there's a new website. How can we, how can we use the Google Dorks to to get into there? Actually, we're not getting into the sites, but we're using the Google data. Mm -hmm. So it's actually how to, what is the best way to to ask the database for what we want? And you. I mean, we do a lot of hackathons now. Um, you were one of the, the original hackathon winners. I think you, you won one of Irina's games yeah. or something like that and ended up coming, well, speaking in America because of that. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about that. Like, what was the, what was the competition about and, you know, what did you do to win back then? Um, if, I look back, if I look back at it, it was a very simple, simple one. <laughs> but it was the first global sourcing contest. Um, it was the one you grab a glass of wine, sit down at the kitchen table, and then sit there for like half an hour, and then, okay, these are the answers, this is it. What you see nowadays with, the, with, the, with all these um, uh, hackathons is that they, they want them to make, they, they want it to make like super, super difficult. Um, you have to know like the whole range of sourcing, which you'd be able uh, to, to, get, to get this, true uh there's even a hackathon i've been into where we got all the answers and then oh you're not on time well we did it within the hour uh -huh. you know that one mark <laughs> mm -hmm. oh man after after king's day 
shot. Man. <laughs> that was so hard. But we managed. Uh, look, and then it know, was a team competition and you were up against another team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They didn't have King's Day and we did. So <laughs> it was foul play. <laughs> So, uh, but that's that's a funny thing. Uh, so, uh, that's, there's there's also a thing like if we're not talking about hackathons, but how to assess a sourcer. Mm -hmm. You cannot assess a sourcer by uh, writing a hackathon, because there's uh, a lot of good sourcers uh, out there who have no clue about half of the syntax uh, you can use. Uh, still, they get other people in. Uh, there are people claiming that they're sourcers uh, being doing really cool, cool stuff on, on LinkedIn. Um, I think yeah, to become, to be a sourcer, to call yourself a sourcer, you should know a bit more than just LinkedIn. Uh, at least know what a Google dork is. Uh, have you, have you noticed I'm not calling them Google hacks anymore? Because uh, you're not hacking them. You just, exactly. <laughs> uh, just, Google Docs is also better for, for all the, the people inside the company because when you start talking about hacking uh, to compliance officers, they, <laughs> they're like, hmm, what are you doing? Get out of my place. I even had that with, uh, with, with a developer I work with. Like, hey, this is how I get your email from, from um, uh, what was it, GitHub. And he was like, what the, what, what? <laughs> I thought I, I hit it well. Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> Except in your commits. Yeah, exactly. You won Irina's competition, and you ended yeah. up you ended up coming to America and speaking to America. Uh, I was I was speaking in America beforehand. Um, that's how I knew Irina as well. Um, I was there in 2010 talking about mobile. Uh, I had a mobile uh, app uh, launched in 2009. Was one of the first in the app store. It was super cool. That's how I got uh, the second time into America by sponsoring the ERE event, opening event. Uh, I knew Glenn, of course, so he brought me into his uh, show in uh, SourceCon. Um, but what I did in 2012 with, uh, with this, um, so I put a blog post out there like, hey, I won the first global sourcing competition. Uh, you can hire me <laughs> and pay me, what was it, 650 euros for four hours. Um, um, at least you know you have the best so whatever results there is there's good results <laughs> and that came out like uh, usually I got 10 uh, in four hours I could get 10 to uh, 30 uh, good people matching the profile uh, plus contact details and I would put them in Google Docs and I would share the Google Docs and then I thought hey this could this could grow I could I could make something out of it um, and then it became a company uh, called People Sourcing Crew, where I had 15 people, uh, people I pulled off uh, from the street, like, hey, you're without a job, I'll train you, uh, and we, we make business, which went well for, for a couple of years, actually five years, and then uh, pure bad luck, uh, I had to close down the company. And um, in the meanwhile, uh, People Sourcing Crew had it was actually it was crazy. We had clients all over the world. Uh, in the beginning, I started with uh, with the people I knew, like Arena. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I had people in Australia, Sweden. So it was like a global thing. All freelancers, so uh, everybody got its cut from from the assignment. Um, and then at some point, I spoke to someone uh, who said, "Well, we can do this in Lithuania, to build a team there." And then after it. One, two years, uh, the company where I put my people there in Lithuania made a pivot. So uh, that's where I started to, to pull the people from the street here in the Netherlands <laughs> and do something good for the community here and get them all uh, a new job. Funny thing is, uh, most of them are still recruiting and uh, still working as sourcers. So that's super cool. Um, then, um, well, well, a lot of training and, and, and more training and the more you do training uh, and the more you are in, in the sourcing business yourself, uh, the more tricks you get there and the more tools you see. And then two years ago, um, we decided to become private investigators. 
uh, we got into this project where uh, we needed to do uh, background checks on people. And there we said, well, that's a fun idea, but we, yeah, but you're good on Google and you find everything from everybody. And yeah, we do. Uh, but in this case, we're not allowed to. Regulations and stuff like that. You need a license for that. Well, what license? It's called a PI license, a private investigator license. Really? Yeah, really. Google it. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. But we're not going to do that. No, but we can do that. So Kim and I decided to become the, the private investigator and get this license, which is a horrible thing to do, by the way. It's a really, oh, man. <laughs> it's like knowing the law book by hat and that's it. No books allowed during the exam and just know it all. <clears throat> horrible. Thank you. Uh, completely filled with all the privacy uh, ruling and like GDPR and everything. So that's one thing. And then I saw this, uh, where we wanted to do this course. Uh, there was this other course called um, uh, Open Source Intelligence. I said, wait, that's something. If you want to learn something as a sourcer, then this is the next level. Go into this. So we got trained by a guy who was uh, from law enforcement. Uh, the whole training, uh, the OSINT uh, experts class we did. So there's, there was three steps, uh, three levels in that training. Uh, get a certificate like, hey, I was there. The second one was like, you're certified. And the, the third one, you're an expert. I got into a register and, and everything. Um, so we got the whole Googling thing. <laughs> from uh, from the view of uh, of a policeman, um, and that was really nice because then you you know, so where we had sources we wanted quick but we want quality. Uh, police wanted super fast. A uh, bit of collateral damage doesn't matter, but as long as we can get there like really fast and we know, like for example, where's this picture being made? I want to know within five minutes, what time of day, uh, where on earth this picture was made. Um, so you get into all these toolings and all these weird things you actually never thought about before. Which open your minds even more like, okay, there's more out there than just Google things. So we got into uh, this training and in the end we did our exams with two people of the cyber police uh, and two of the military police. And then, hey, the recruiters are back. You're still in here. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> um, so that was the next step. And then you get into this. Uh, so because of that training, we got into automation a lot. Uh, so we started automating a lot of things we were doing. Uh, got the things quicker and also got into quicker decision making than we did before. Usually when you read a resume as a recruiter, you take six seconds for the yes or no uh, pile. And then after the six seconds, you take another minute to really define if this is a good one or not. Um, this we tried to, to automate as much as possible. Uh, so we use a lot of data scrapers. So, okay, we have a lot of data in LinkedIn, get it out of LinkedIn, then reorganize the whole thing and then get through it quicker than, than we did before, like open the profile, open the profile, open the profile. Um, so that's what it brought us, uh, what brought us to the next step. And then I had this team with 15 people. Uh, and now we're two of us and we do more than we did with 15 people. <laughs> Couldn't we ever thought of that before? Uh, obviously not. Um, so um, how we do sourcing nowadays is like most people. Um, no. There's a few people on earth that do sourcing like we do. And uh, most of them are, you'll see speaking, uh, and a lot of them are still hidden. I like to get to know those people, but they're usually too swamped in work, or well, the real sorters mostly are not as communicative as as the people we see on stage, and even the people on stage are not always as communicative. You've been part of the the Dutch sourcing community, obviously before the Dutch sourcing community even existed. Um, yeah. And for everybody, anybody who's not, hasn't been in the Dutch uh, sourcing community um, or, or kind of know, like you, Netherlands has one of that kind of biggest concentrations of sourcers and people who call themselves sourcers, uh, probably anywhere in the world, uh, but especially in Europe. 
Um, talk a little bit about like how how that community grown, like where because you've obviously been part of it from the very beginning. A lot of people I trained myself, mm -hmm. <laughs> like a lot of them in the Netherlands. Uh, one of the fun examples, like uh, you know Jan Bernard, who's uh, is a he's a sourcing authority here in the Netherlands as well. He um, well the funny thing is he was one of the the juniors I trained back in the years. And he got it and he felt for it. And you have to fall in love with sourcing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, it's not some, something you do next to your recruiting thing. It's no. something you focus on. And then recruiting is the second thing uh, because it comes from sorting. Um, I've been shouting about the word sourcing since whenever we got there. Uh, put it on a map. Um, there was one other guy, uh, Ricardo Rizemasso, who started the first trainings on sourcing in the Netherlands. Uh, he asked me when I got self-employed, like, could you come and train for, uh, for me? Because I, there's not enough trainers. Uh, then I um, used this material, like, okay, so you set up a training like this, and then I, I took it to the next level. Um, I can do training nowadays like uh, using one slide but that's mm -hmm. purely for the people like oh it's me standing in front of you <laughs> and uh <laughs> and then get them through all the commands and everything uh just by talking let them do the, these these things uh the community grew uh jan bernard made this uh, dutch sorcerer thing on on facebook so then it's the start of a community uh what we see nowadays is that there's a lot of um, international recruiters coming here, uh, mm -hmm. like Ava, like uh, like Teddy, uh, like um, uh, I could. Well, usually you have these train name dropping like Google. It's not now. Uh, but a lot of those uh, girls and guys who just entered and, and like it. Uh, there's a lot of companies who actually understand what sourcing is, mm -hmm. apart from buying this uh, LinkedIn licenses and, and put the juniors on there. Um, so if you look at the Dutch sourcing community, it's not really as big as, as you might think. Um, when we organized the People Sourcing Playground uh, events, it was like uh, come in at 3 o'clock and at 5 we start pizza and some beer. And then two, in the two hours in between, we, we talk about sourcing. And uh, here we talk about uh, email sourcing. And there we talk about automation. And there we talk about uh, the latest tricks on whatever website you've seen. Uh, we talk about tools that was we got easily like 40 or 50 people in there but most of them would like just would like to see what's happening actually what is sourcing and um, somehow uh, sourcing became talent sourcing and talent sourcing is then cheap labor uh, finding people and then call them and do all the stuff the recruiter should do where I see sorting still as uh, find the people that match the profile uh, and get their contact details. And once you start communicating, then we that's the recruitment part. So if you look at the the, the work the sourcer does now, um, it's way more valuable than than the process. Um, uh, what is it called? The the one the one who get uh, who guides the process, mm -hmm. who's nowadays called a recruiter. <laughs> like okay, there's a person who wants to talk to us and he well I can talk about it but hiring manager is much better at talking about the role so let me make an appointment for this person who wants to talk to us with the hiring manager and then if the hiring manager wants another interview with him or another talk with him I will organize the other interview as well and a good sourcer then at that point um, where he has to reach out nowadays has also um, fine-tuned like the salary expectations and, and when he can start and all that. So the recruiter doesn't have to. Uh, and and he already explained to Sorcer sort of why he's interested in this particular role. And so he doesn't have to. Um, it's up to the hiring manager to do those, those quality interviews and not the recruiter. He doesn't have to. It just check, 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 um, which is already done by the, by the sourcer. So the recruiter only has to plan the interviews. Uh, unfortunately, we're, the, the sources are not paid 
like that. They were still paid as like cheap labor and a recruiter is, oh, I have a recruitment business partner, HR business partner, I'm, I'm partner. Uh, maybe it's an age thing. Like uh, it used to be really cool to be a recruiter. The coolest thing about a recruiter in my days was like you go out and network, uh, get to know people, get into these communities, talk to them, uh, which is now not done anymore. Uh, but we can now find all those people online. So we tune in a, in a, in a network and we, we scrape all the names, <laughs> aggregate all the emails <laughs> and then send out this, this cool email uh, campaign. And if they don't respond within two days, you send another email like, hey, earlier this week I sent you an email. Unfortunately, you may have not had the time or uh, what do you think about it? Would you like more information? And then the, the last email, God damn, it's been a week. <laughs> so I replied, it's A, because you hate me because I'm a recruiter. Fair enough. Or B, uh, you just uh, a swap with work, uh, like to make an appointment for next week. Usually that third email always works. You always get a response. Like, okay, now you make me laugh. <laughs> I mean, you were in, you were a big part of the sourcing summit um, in Amsterdam and that whole kind of what grew out of that. And I guess that's a big part of the, the Dutch sourcing community as well. Um, tell me a bit about this, the story with that. Like, I know that you and Kim has been very big part of that running the last, what is it, six, seven years now. Um, were you there from the beginning or, or how was that? Yeah, Phil gave me a call. So Phil Tusing, uh, organizing uh, the, the, the sourcing summits. Uh, he gave me a call because I was, uh, for a very long time, the only Dutch recruiter who uh, went to all these conferences uh, abroad. So if you go to the Netherlands, call Gordon, uh, he knows people. Um, and that's how we, how the, the first contact was, uh, hangout call uh, on, on the Amsterdam canals. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey there. <laughs> oh, you're Phil. Oh, hi, I'm Gordon. <laughs> um, so um, then a couple of years back, um, when Kim and I went to Sosus together. Mm -hmm. um, Phil at some point asked, Gordon, can you help again? And then we got into the, the Meerfaart where a lot of things need to be done and were unorganized at that point, uh, which was more easy to put us in, in between the organizing, uh, well, in between Phil and, and, uh, and the organization there. Um, yeah, that's, that's how we got totally into that. Yeah, because in the beginning it was very much, it was kind of run at Randstad and things like that the first yeah. couple of years, or? Yeah, that was organized. Uh, that was, uh, I believe, Balas was working at Randstad. Uh, that's how we got into the Randstad building. And Randstad liked the event uh, because they just started Source Rights uh, with Glen Ketty. So it was all like, okay, it's, it's, it's okay that we do it here. But then uh, the Randstad building, our venue got uh, too small. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning it was like 250 people, and nowadays it's like 500 people, so it's, it's well, double the size. So we have to go for another venue, and then he came up with the Mirvar. Yeah. You talked a little bit about tools, and, and obviously in your years you've both developed tools and used a lot of tools. What does your kind of sourcing tool stack look like today? Uh, uh, well, there's obviously a scraper. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a multi-highlighter. Uh, there's Hello Talent. I think those are the three main main tools I use. Uh, I use the multi highlighter to, to to have an easy read on on what I find. I use the scraper to to get a lot of people in, uh, reorganize, and then select what I want to see. Um, instead of clicking, and I want to have my own well, my own. I do say that it's easier to open uh, profiles from, from Google Sheets than it is from the tool you're working on at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then I use Hello Talent to, uh, to get the people that match, to put them on a list, which I can share uh, GDPR compliance to our customer. That's how we use it. Oh, and apart from that, of course, I use uh, Google. <laughs> a lot of Google. I'm totally into Google. Google. And if it's not in Google, I go to Bing or another search engine. But most of it, I find in Google. Gordon, if, uh, if people want to stay in touch with you, uh, you know, find your old blogs and your, your training from Black Den, um, how can they best do that? Uh, 
Uh, Google me. <laughs> it's all out there. Uh, I wrote a blog. Um, I wrote a blog uh, called uh, GordonLokenberg.wordpress.com. I used that fancy names back in the years, but I <laughs> deleted those. It's, it's like me. Uh, the website, um, thelockenbergs.com. Uh, thelockenbergs.com is our new website, our latest one. Uh, there's a blog section in there as well, which we try to cultivate uh, with a old, few of my old blog posts. Uh, I try to combine it now. And for the rest, uh, you just want to hear me talking because I'm a lousy writer anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know why I do video. Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Look, thank you very much. Um, I look uh, for, yeah, forward to meeting you soon again when we get out of this lockdown. And uh, Yeah. And... Come to Amsterdam. Ah, definitely will. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cool. Uh, one more thing. With uh, amazing hirings, uh, tech sourcing training, what can, can people expect from, uh, from, from you and Kim's part of it? Oh, um... And it's it's mostly the basics, like uh, getting the getting the hold of of the the syntax, and understanding what an X-ray is and how you get into how you get a, get an overview of websites without going to those websites, which saves you a lot of time. I think that's uh, the biggest part you can learn from us. And then it's in June. It's uh, Sozu V, the virtual sourcing summit, and there's a lot more coming. <laughs> so. Stay tuned. Who's your, from the from the kind of training point of view, like who's this for? Like who's the you know who would you think would get the most out of actually doing this training? Uh, I think the the amazing hiring training is mostly for people who have never done sourcing before, uh, or who are totally into tech sourcing but still uh, still hanging on LinkedIn. And then so to is like see all the different views of other great sourcers. I think that's that's. How you get better? Do a course first. How, I, how we always say: read some blogs about it, get some training, and go to conferences to learn more. Perfect. Thank yeah. You. You're welcome. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel, which will help us meet more people um, and grow the community.